Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And Skyrim is the exact opposite of a small game. With an almost never-ending amount of NPCs to meet, sights to see, and missions to take up, The Elder Scrolls V is quite abundant in her amount of content and much of it is peppered with easter eggs and hidden secrets for the Dragonborn to uncover. But now that it's been seven years, many players may finally be beginning to question if they've dug up everything that Bethesda buried in their RPG, found every reference, discovered each secret illusion, and stumbled upon all the hidden facts. Well, rest assured, there's still probably much evading our gaze. Sit back and relax as we take a look at yet another 10 tiny details you may still have missed in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. Starting off, we begin our journey not in Skyrim itself, but on the ash-covered island of Solstheim. Here in his Tower of Telmithrin, we can meet a Telvanni Master Wizard, named Neloth. The Dark Elf plays a major role in the DLC's primary storyline, and also offers his own assortment of side quests. Neloth is a great mage. The problem is that he knows it, and is quite stuck up when speaking to the player. Imagine that, being so full of yourself that you talk down to the half-dragon chosen one. Not exactly the most humble of fellows. Well, if the College of Winterhold questline has been completed prior to your first encounter with the magically inclined Dunmer, some unique, otherwise hidden dialogue with him will become available wherein he'll actually offer something of a compliment to the Dragonborn. Take a listen. Winterhold, that small college that is falling into the Sea of Ghosts? You're the one that recovered the Staff of Magnus. Impressive. Talvis should finish his apprenticeship in a couple of decades. Come see me then. I think I could teach you a trick or two. Next on our list, when you arrive for the first time, the town of Morthal will be in turmoil. A recent series of disappearances and a house fire that left a mother and her daughter dead have rendered the population terrified and in an uproar. During the quest, Laid to Rest, you'll discover that the party responsible for such chaos is a small den of vampires hiding out in the swamps just northeast of the settlement. They plan on turning all of Morthal's citizens into their undead workers, one by one, and are making some surprising progress. It, of course, will fall upon you to foil such a plan. Early on in the quest, we'll learn that one of the village's citizens, a woman named Alva, is secretly a vampire herself, in on the scheme. It's indeed through her diaries that we're able to figure out everything that's happening. Now, while we learn about Alva's hidden affiliations and laid to rest, if the player is already a vampire themselves before beginning the mission, and you try to speak with her, she'll hint at her true undead nature, and also reveals she can detect yours as well. I know you for what you are. This town's blood is ours. Leave it. Now we must return to our roles, lest the sheep suspect the wolves. Coming at number three, speaking of vampires, we all know and love... Okay, well, maybe not love, but know of Babette. The eternal ten-year-old undead assassin working for the Dark Brotherhood, who's hiding over 300 years of life experience in a little girl's body. Alas, this character seems to have been inspired by, or at least exists in reference to, the 1976 Anne Rice novel Interview with the Vampire, wherein the protagonist has a 70-year-old vampiric daughter in the body of a five-year-old. That daughter's name is Claudia, but that same protagonist has a love interest named Babette. Oddly enough, at the end of the book, Claudia ultimately is killed after the vampire den she lives in is set ablaze. Likewise, in Skyrim, Babette narrowly survives the Penitus Oculatus' sacking and burning of the Dark Brotherhood Sanctuary in Skyrim, so there's a few parallels. For fourth spot, when in combat, Brynjolf, one of the more central members of Riften's Thieves Guild, may say the following phrase. So, it's to the pain then. This is a clever easter egg, nodding to the film The Princess Bride, particularly a scene where one of the central protagonists, Wesley, tells Prince Humperdinck that the pair will battle to the pain rather than to the death, and goes on to explain in pretty grueling detail why fighting to the pain will be far less pleasant than to the death, which ends up convincing Humperdinck to surrender. I'd love to show the full clip, but I'm sure you already know why I can't. Halfway through at number 5, ward spells fall under the Restoration School of Magic, and are essentially magical shields that reduce the effect of spells directed against the caster of the ward. Well, funnily enough, wards are also capable of blocking Charis and Frostbite Venom attacks as well as standard magic. 
The reason for this seems to be more of an oversight on Bethesda's part rather than anything else. As Venom is technically classified by Skyrim's game engine as a spell being casted by any insect or spider. And a ward, of course, is functional against all spells in general. So the next time you go out planning to clear a cave, consider keeping a ward spell on hand if you expect any creepy crawlies to be inside. Sixth, the book, Great Harbingers, documents the history of the Companions. Specifically, each of the guild's leaders, or Harbingers, leading up to the Third Era. One of those Harbingers, who allegedly assumed power several hundred years after the Companions' founding in the reign of Ysgrimor, went by the name Cyric the Lofty. He's considered especially noteworthy, because he was the first non at Morin slash Nord to be given such a position, as he was Redguard in origin. According to the text, Cyric began his service to the Companions as a mere servant. But over time, and through a series of incredibly impressive demonstrations, the Red Guard worked his way up to the faction's de facto leadership position. It's said that his time in the position was short-lived, but he brought a new level of bladework knowledge to Yovaskar that continues to be passed down to this very day. Cyric the Lofty's name, although, alludes to that of Cyric Lofton, the man who played Sisko in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Who would have thought, the folks of Bethesda being fans of fiction? Next, Sibyl Stentor is the court wizard of Solitude. And she's also secretly a vampire too, but that's not too important for this factoid. You see, another mage who also spends much time in the city's royal palace is Meloron. Meloron is a high elf, who unlike Sibyl, doesn't serve the crown directly, but instead has privately been hired by one of the court's thanes, Eriker, to do his bidding and conduct various research experiments. In the event Sibyl is murdered to death, Meloron will take her place and be promoted to the position of true court wizard, much to his satisfaction. Now, here's where things get cool. If Sibyl has died and you're the one responsible for her death, when you ask Meloron about his promotion, he'll actually allude to knowing that you're the one behind the crime, but thankfully doesn't seem all that interested in holding it against you. Now that Sibyl Stentor is out of the picture, I am indeed. And the court is, well, free of her eccentricities. Moving into her quarters was an interesting process. It does indeed. You know, I hear you had something to do with Sibyl Stentor's demise. That must have been a hard bit of business. I hear Stentor had been alive for a long, long time. Coming at number 8, the Dawnguard DLC introduced a radical overhaul of Skyrim's pre-existing vanilla werewolf and vampire systems. If the player ultimately decided that aligning with the Volcar Vampire Clan was the way to go, the new vampire abilities would be yours. In contrast, the Dawnguard offered those of the Wolf. Now, in order to join up with the Dawnguard, who are literal vampire hunters, if you're already a vampire, they'll demand that you first figure out a way to get cured. Spoiler alert, there's a mage out there who will help you out. However, if you're already a werewolf and instead wish to align yourself with Harkin's Volkahar clan, when you speak to him, he'll have some special dialogue, acknowledging your situation and promising to be able to take care of it himself. Yes, I can smell it on you. The power of my blood will purge that filth and to make you whole again. Getting close to the end here at number 9, this is a nod that more people are familiar with, but still one I've yet to cover nonetheless. Eric is a Nord living at his father's tavern in Rorikstead, the Frostfruit Inn. When we meet him, he talks about dreams of one day getting off the small farm and living a life of adventure. However, his father is unambiguously opposed to those ambitions, demanding his son stay home and continue to help the family business. If you're able to pass a speech check, or just fork over the appropriate amount of gold to buy his son some armor, Eric's father will eventually give in and promise to support his child and his goals. If you get the old man to change his mind, afterwards you can return to the Frostroot Inn in about a week or so in game time, to find that Eric now has a full suit of armor with his name changed and a new title added, to now say, Eric the Slayer, and the Dragonborn can recruit him as a follower. Well, the inclusion of this character by Bethesda is actually a tribute to one of their fans, by the name of Eric West, who went by the alias Imok the Slayer on various online forms. Eric had unfortunately been diagnosed with cancer, and through the Make-A-Wish Foundation was invited to visit Bethesda Game Studios' headquarters in Maryland during the development of Skyrim, where he was allowed to play what Bethesda had finished so far for the game and shown around the studio. He also had the opportunity to meet with Todd Howard and various other developers, and everyone all around says they had a great time. Unfortunately, Eric passed away as a result of his condition just six months before Skyrim's official release, but Bethesda made a point to ensure his memory would live on within the game nonetheless. 
And finally, last on our list, we have a bit of a mystery on our hands. Though a small one, that takes us back to Solstheim. Where, on a beach just west of Frossel, we can find a chest, next to two skeletons. The chest itself will be filled with some random level loot, specifically jewels. Though, other than that, we don't really know what happened here. It's unclear if this treasure chest and both the skeletons washed up as a result of a shipwreck or something to that effect, or maybe these two men found the chest as they were walking along the beach, but for whatever reason passed away shortly afterwards. If this is the result of a shipwreck, what caused it? Was it simple bad weather conditions? Perhaps pirates? Maybe just a bad captain? We may never know, but hopefully all of this wasn't related to a FedEx package delivery gone wrong. Yes, I included this entire detail in this video just to get that castaway reference in there. You're welcome! But with that, we are going to wrap up. Yet another 10 tiny details you may still have missed in The Elder Scrolls Skyrim Part 41. Thanks for stopping by, everyone. Which of what we dove into today was your favorite or most interesting? And what tiny details or hidden away secret Easter eggs and references do you know of that I've still missed? Leave a comment down below. As always, like ratings are very much appreciated. Again, thanks for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everybody.